Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this uh, European Time of Change panel discussion. Uh, my name is uh, Alexander Bodicata, coordinator of uh, Mara Europa Center for Political Economy and Business. Uh, and it's a great pleasure uh, both to participate in this panel and uh, with, our, with our guests and uh, with our distinguished uh, participants. Um, and also, um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, event. Uh, before the presentation, uh, let's have the regular uh, regulation how the presentation will go uh, on. Um, first, I would like to, to give uh, the time to each speaker to present uh, their material. So, uh, I think if you are 10 minutes, it's, uh, uh, and after the presentation, we are going to discussion session and uh, commentary, uh, questions, and uh, answers. Um, now, allow me to briefly introduce our keynote speaker, and, uh, and after that, uh, invited panelist. Uh, our keynote speaker is uh, Mr. Olivier de Richeux. Uh, he is the president of Business Family Foundation. Uh, this foundation, its, uh, its head office in Canada, provides uh, multimedia educational to entrepreneurial families around the world. Uh, he spent 20 <coughs> years in the tourism industry uh, in both public and private sector. His experience includes developing and implementing international tourism strategies for uh, many organizations, among them Euro Disney Resort and uh, France Service. Uh, in addition to his career achievements, he has participated in uh, EU economic development mission in uh, Crimea, uh, and humanitarian missions to Lebanon, Iraq, Ethiopia, uh, and Ar Armenia. Uh, he is also a board member of uh, Mission and Fans, uh, an NGO based in, uh, based in Monaco. Uh, so, so, so let's try to uh, start from this. So, uh, Mr. Richard, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So I'm going to have a difficult task after uh, bringing a little uh, positivism about uh, Europe and what we can all do together. Um, let me, um, perhaps, um, we had a discussion uh, with your professor and the dean before walking uh, in this room. And, um, and of course, we talked about entrepreneurship and how could we possibly re-enchant you with, you know, with uh, entrepreneurship. Um, this is something we have heard around uh, Eastern Europe that um, there is not a very strong appetite to risk taking. And um, I'm going to try to talk to you a bit today about how exciting this is. Um, on a personal background, I come from family business and we are in our 20th generation. It's been 500 years that we are trying to empower one generation after the, after the next. And I don't know, I wanted to ask you whether you have an idea of what do family-owned businesses represent over the world today? Any uh, guess of the percentage of family-owned businesses in the global economy? 60%. <coughs> Any? No? Okay, in excess of 75% of the businesses worldwide are still family owned. And they account for over 60% of the world GDP. This is the same in Europe. Um, and I think this is something that very often is, uh, uh, you know, not taken into consideration. That means that the real economy in, in our hands, it's in the end of our families, of those who have started businesses before, of you who are going to take over or start your own businesses. And this is something that is uh, very important because I think we're hearing uh, you know, how bad the world is doing it, uh, often forgetting that uh, the economy, our real economy is based on common sense, on people that uh, our job creator, our value creator, are attached to the 
place, the country where they were born and where they started their, their business. They are uh, accountable to society and uh, I think altogether they, uh, they are responsible, they are responsible owners. Uh, too often I think when we look at capitalism we look at the people who, um, who misbehave. And uh, it's pretty rare that you will have, you know, the press will talk about the, uh, those uh, entrepreneurs or family who are bringing uh, a great contribution <coughs> to, uh, and to the, their community. Uh, we tend to think that family-owned businesses are represent capital with a face. And though, for those of you, I think, the, in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in, in Romania, 65% of your businesses are, fa are family-owned. So it can be really from the very small... Uh, you know, dad and, and mom coffee shop around the corner to a multinational. Can you see uh, just uh, one company that is family owned that you have in mind, a large one that would come to your mind? In Romania? No. Oh, in Romania, perhaps I don't know them well enough, but uh, otherwise in the, in the world, you know, that are employing many people. Porsche? Yeah, Porsche is BMW, he's uh, uh, Walmart is, I mean, they are many, many, many large businesses that are still family-owned, although the family might not control the entire company. Now, for example. Yes, that's it. <coughs> so, if we look at how do they perform, because this is also important, you know, those companies that usually do not spend money they don't have, so they don't, they don't, they're not good at contracting debt. So therefore, you know, they are, uh, in that sense, very, very responsible. Any idea of how those who are quoted companies do uh, perform versus the non-family-owned companies? Any guess? Over a long time, uh, uh, they overperform 5% a year over a 10 years period of time. So this is wherever country you take them from, because there is that level of trust that is brought into a family firm. Now, of course, they uh, have done come with some challenges, and one of which, of course, is the tax issue. Uh, they like to say, you know, we were born free, but taxed to death. And, um, and there's a need, there's a need throughout Europe for uh, making our policymaker understand that uh, you cannot reinvent your economy every 30 years. Mm -hmm. And when uh, you know, people that are dedicated have started a firm wherever it is in Europe and have sweated for it for several years, there is no reason that they should pay 30, 40, sometimes over 40% in uh, gift tax or inheritance tax in order to transfer that business to their children, <coughs> which is still the case in many European countries. Although 11 uh, have uh, now dropped completely the inheritance tax uh, in, uh, in recent years. <coughs> but perhaps one example I wanted to take is a, a country where, um, which is uh, Sweden, where some lobbying is uh, important. I think individually, if you take these, you know, family-owned business, they don't, they might not represent a significant number of the GDP. Therefore, the policymakers are not that interested. But in 2002, the um, uh, the hundred largest family-owned businesses in Sweden went to the, their government. They altogether, they amount for 27 percent of the Swedish GDP. Went to their for the, to their government and say, you know what, we have options. We uh, operate businesses <coughs> around the world. Uh, but there's no way we're going to continue paying that 40% tax on uh, business transition. If by January 1st, 20, uh, 2003, you know, the, uh, the inheritance tax is not at zero, we are out of Sweden. And of January 1st, 2003, the, Swede, the uh, inheritance tax in Sweden was abolished. So, this to say that uh, these businesses are uh, operating in a in a smart, in an inclusive, uh, and in a sustainable <coughs> way. <coughs> so therefore their growth might not be as spectacular, uh, you know, depending on the country, the context, but they're very resilient. 
and um, and they're showing over time that uh, you know things and behavior that no other companies could. Typically, uh, during cyclical downturn, they are uh, usually they are able because the um, their governance system is such that. Uh, they can go to the rest of the family and say, okay, look, it's not going that good. Uh, we have two options. One is, one is to lay off our employees. The other one is to cut our dividend for, for this year. There are not that many uh, you know, all, uh, shareholders around the world that would accept a solution like this. Now, I, of course, we, we know that you are going to be inheriting a, a world that is... Uh, you know, that is unpredictable, that is vulnerable. And uh, the one thing the family owned business are very comfortable with are the risk. They know how to assess the risk and they are very comfortable with that. We are all comfortable with the risk. What we're not comfortable with is, are the uncertainties. When we don't know what's going to happen next specifically when it comes from taxation. But risk, you know, is something inherent to how we operate. And uh, not to say that I think many of us like it. Now, if we look at, you know, what's uh, in front of us, we know that uh, the business models are shifting drastically. And there are little chances that you're going, for those of you who come from the family business, <coughs> or for your children in one generation, that you're going to want to put your feet in the footstep of the previous generation. Because uh, the business do not operate the same way. Because the, uh, you know, the technological evolution is such that the business models are just uh, changing very, very rapidly. Out of these standards and pros, uh, existing businesses, 70 in, uh, in 20 years time, 75% of those standard and poor's new will be new businesses. And the lifespan of our business, we, we use and we are very fortunate to have been around 500 years, but I have to, get to tell you it's not without failures, it's not without bankruptcy, and, uh, and just uh, terrible moments. But nevertheless, what we have is that there is an entrepreneurial DNA that there will always be somebody in the family who wants to take up the challenge and start something new. And this is where we strongly feel that uh, over and beyond the, entrepreneur, uh, the entrepreneurship, there is something new that is going to arise. And this is more intrapreneurship. If we consider that uh, there are many businesses uh, existing where the rising generation has the same DNA that the previous one, then we are proposing to use these existing businesses in order to spin off rather than start up. Start up is difficult. I mean, for those of you who start, you who try, for those of you who will try, it's a difficult exercise. Now, when you know that a, a family or an existing business can be used as an incubator, you know, for starting, for those of you who are, if not risk averse, because otherwise you'll go into the administration, but who think that, uh, you know, they are, uh, it's a little risky knowing that you're going to get from that existing businesses not only the technical support, uh, the love money or the fund, uh, the seeding fund to start your business and the time, moreover the time. Because in entrepreneurship, in entrepreneurship our problem is that uh, in the first three years less than 50%, 15, one five percent of the businesses will still be around. When they're backed up by an existing business, it's the reverse. 95% of the businesses will still be operating after five years. Which means that this is really something for which we, um, we advocate. Uh, and uh, perhaps the last uh, 
uh, number I want to, to give your last guess I'd like you to, uh, uh, to give me. Uh, if, you, um, if we do look at um, the, uh, how those uh, businesses are, are being funded, how do, they, uh, uh, how do they start? What would you say is the venture capital uh, putting in a, new, in a new business, in a, in a startup? versus what is brought by the family, by the friends, or the people that are going to help you start? Any guess? Okay, I'm going to help you with that one. Ven venture capital provides less than 1% of the capital. 85% brings from family, from friends. So, uh, although in Romania you might not have had like we had in other parts of the world, you know, long-lasting businesses. I think it's important, as you might think of creating your own business, just to turn to those who understand you the best and will understand the reason why, because you don't want to get into the administration. I mean, otherwise, you know, the debt is going to be even bigger for your children. Uh -huh. So you probably don't want that. So be entrepreneurs, I'm sure there are plenty of people that can understand that, take your own risk, but limit them by, again, being backed up by the, the people who, uh, who love you, the people who understand you and who respect your, uh, you know, your sense of entrepreneurship. Thank you. Pleasure to introduce uh, our first panelist, Mr. Daniel Kadi. Mr. Daniel Kadi is a very well-known speaker for many of uh, He's the project director of uh, Southeast Europe for Freedom Human Foundation for Freedom in Sofia, a uh, non-profit organization that promotes liberal values, uh, rule of law, and economic freedom. <coughs> uh, having worked uh, previously for the foundation in Germany, India, and Russia, uh, Mr. Daniel Kadi is actively involved promoting entrepreneurship uh, and uh, personal and political responsibility. His main interest uh, lay in the field of liberal policy solutions, economic and social sciences, as well as entrepreneurship and citizen participation in government. He received degrees in governmental studies from the University of Erfurt, European studies from the University of Hamburg, and international studies from the University of Bern. Mr. Daniel Kadi, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and I have to all my shame admit that I've never been arrested in that time <laughs> here nor anywhere else. They shot at me in Russia once, but that doesn't count, I would assume. Counts more. Why <laughs> did they hit you? Well, uh, they didn't hit me. You know what Churchill said? Churchill said, there's nothing more exhilarating in life than to be shot at without result. <laughs> well, see, at least something. So, looking at the, the title of today's panel, um, going from jobs, entrepreneurship, sharing economy, and the European demos, I tried something that is including everything that's in the title. Let's see how that works out in the end of the day. So one thing I've been thinking a lot about in the past is that sharing economy is the death of capitalism. I have read that so many times, or topics like sharing economy is trying to find an a democratic model, democratic economic model, without realizing that market economy is the most democratic economic model you can find anywhere in the world. Just let, let's think about very, very shortly. What, what is market economy? Um, it's division of labor. It is collaboration, voluntary collaboration, and it's voluntary exchange. So it sounds very democratic, very free to me unlike other things that have been tried, especially in this very region in which I have been working for a number of years now. One thing that these guys who make these kind of claims seem to not understand is that market economy has everything <coughs> changing. We're talking about a different kind of market economy than we were taking, talking about, well, in Manchester times. And we will be talking about different kind of market economy, a different type of capitalism, in five to ten years. And one thing that is the driver of change is the increase of information. Um, when I started studying, we had something we called books. 
<laughs> um, then I was the proud owner, the older amongst you might remember, that is Encarta, the Microsoft Inclusopedia on CD. I was very proud of it. Um, then ISDN came and I had access to the great world of the internet. And then well, there was Wikipedia, there, now there is live coverage on, on 4G well, on my smartphone and my tablet. So there is an all, all more rapid change. There are new services emerging. And work is significantly changing. If you look at work, and compared to the work that has been done 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, it's completely different and to a large extent. So as, as you were starting to pose a question to the audience, I might just do the same. Looking at Germany, my, my native country, in the, by the end of the uh, 19th century, what was the share of agriculture in the economy? How, and what was the, how many people worked in, in agriculture? 40%. Almost. 60%. 60 because of Bavaria. Yeah, somebody has to grow the beer. That's true. <laughs> what, what is the number now? No, it, it's it's just under two percent. So from over sixty to under two percent, just well, in, in a little more than a hundred years, industry went to, from thirty percent to twenty percent. And what has been rising is, well, service sector and information technology. But what we have here is. An <coughs> ever higher speed of change. And that creates a lot of fear in, in people. And there is a lot of disinformation. People don't understand what is going on, especially lawmakers don't understand what's going on. And just to give you one idea of how little they understand, that is I was sitting in the European Parliament some years ago in an advisor uh, meeting, and people were talking about, let's create the European Google. And one of my colleagues asked a very important question. Are you stupid? <laughs> Because as soon as Europe would have decided on where to create Google, how many funds should go to that, where it should be created, who should be on the board, who should control it, well, Google would have installed the self-driving cars um, where you talk with, with the well equivalent of, of, of Google from, from of Siri, and who drives them to the next best pizza place where you try to use the European equivalent of Bing. Who uses Bing, by the way? Nobody. So, <laughs> trying to use your... European equivalent of Bing to find the same pizza place myself um, driving cars bring me to that is provided by Google. So, but what people fear the most is the loss of jobs. And as I said, that economy is ever changing. Jobs are changing as well. My the my father's father made saddles, so he was a saddler, not not settler but saddler. Um, and he said to my to my my father, so you should do the same. And I thought, no, I'm not doing that. <coughs> I'm going to to uh, sell records, um, and and go to music instrument. Like, what are you doing? Music? That's not industry. And you have to do something with your hands. And that is true for for most of my friends' families, where the fathers were <coughs> plumbers, or work in construction, and so on and so forth. And my friends were saying, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take over the family business and in that. Sorry for that. Um, <laughs> because things are changing. This is a business model that doesn't work for me anymore. But that creates fear, because a lot of people are used to doing the things their fathers and their forefathers did before them. And this kind of uncertainty, not knowing what comes in the future, creates a lot of fear. And this is also why, in, especially in France, Mexico, and other places, people were starting beating up Uber drivers, for instance because there was something challenging their business model that they have had for years and years. And that is the same thing that happened, I, I, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it, Lubitz, the guys who were uh, in the, by the end of the 1900s, Luddites. 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 <laughs> smashing the machines, um, because um, these were taking away their jobs, allegedly. So what, what is behind this idea that market economy that changed all the business <coughs> evil, we, we touched on that and, and during the first panel. One thing is that we were taught that market economy is the root of all evil. Mihail just talked about that in, in, in his speech. I just read an article about not new textbooks in, in schools in Austria, um, how businesses are represented there. 
as the as, and indeed as a, as the root of all evil. One second thing is that people are have been taught that they don't need to change, that things will always be like they are right now, and one of the drivers for that are labor unions, for instance, mm -hmm. saying, okay. You will always work in strong construction, you will always work in this company, and you don't have to change. You will earn the same amount of money, it will always go up, without realizing there is technological advance. And third, people are more likely to believe negative information. <coughs> and this is the very natural um, psychological effect um, that we concentrate on the bad stuff. And this is indeed an evolutionary uh, advantage. Just take, for instance, if I know that there's a, a, a tiger in that cave, I will not go in there, so I don't get eaten. But therefore, people are more prone to believe bad information. And this is also something, you, you if you watch the news, and I, I know Romanian are very keen on watching the news, because everywhere I go, there's a TV running with uh, Antena 3, or however they are called. <laughs> I hear there's some bad news on those TV channels as well. But instead of concentrating or even mentioning good stuff, even, I think it was two or three days ago that I was listening to German radio and there was, it was actually nothing bad to report. And so they were talking about a 22-year-old was bitten by a shark in Australia. Why do I care about that? Because it's sensational. It, it, it's bad news. It creates this sense of fear. It's something going on. Yeah? Why do I, uh, sorry for the Americans, but why do I care if there's a traffic, if there's a heavy accident in Pennsylvania? I don't care about that because it doesn't affect my life. There are other things to report, but that is more sensational. And people are more reacting to that, more emotional. That's why it's all that's also one of the reasons why the social industry in Europe is so successful. For instance, in Europe and Austria, they invented things like <coughs> relative poverty, which is if you earn less than 60% of the median income, you're poor. That means that every student in Germany, which make up a lot of these 60% guys under the 60%, are poor. I never felt poor as a student. Um, I was going to cinema, I, I was going to drink, I was going to clubbing, I was studying, I was doing things. So I was not poor. But people are trying to tell me that I was poor. And there is are the politicians who live on that, who try to sell you that the more complex the world becomes, the more they need to regulate, because you can't do it on your own, because you're stupid. That's what I say, don't explain okay? And then you see uh, Alina Giurgiu and Mr. Dragnia singing Armana, Armana singing even, even in Ivory, because they're absolutely in line on this. So they, are, they believe in protectionism, in regulation, because it justifies their job, and it justifies the jobs of, of administration. But look at the, let's look at the positive side. In the world, they have, in recorded history, and even before that, never have we been so prosperous. Never has child and mother mortality been so low anywhere in the world. Never have, has life expectancy <coughs> and well, wealth been so high in, in the world. And even, John, as you mentioned, the German Spiegel, which is not known for well, bringing good news. Um, they even have no series which is called Good News, indeed, where they talk about how life is actually getting better. And this is because of the advancement of the free market. Look at places like Taiwan, <coughs> where in the 1970s, it was a, well, they live on, on substance, subsistence economy. They were producing the older ones amongst you might remember, the little plastic figurines. And now they are the, the properties of computer chips. So, <coughs> And this is because of the free market and something the German, the German, I might almost say, but he was in fact Austrian, even though the lines in the 19th century were quite blurred. Mr. Schumpeter called creative destruction. There is something new coming, replacing something old, and that again sets free creative potential. And it opens vast opportunities for entrepreneurs, especially with more information lowering market entry barriers. I don't know if anyone has seen the, the speech by Elon Musk, uh, a little over a week ago when he was introducing Tesla 3. It was brilliant, because then he was explaining capitalism 101, meaning, well, we produce, we, we um, designed a Tesla prototype, <coughs> say we have a ridiculous price for that, and a very low number in, in cars, and then we took the, took the profit, and then we had the second model, 
where we had a little lower price and a little more production, and then we took the profit, and now we're producing Tesla Model 3, and without government subsidies. So this is capitalism, this is entrepreneurship 101. So, and this is what it's all about at the moment. <coughs> this is what this electric chair economy and entrepreneurship is all about. Finding things you didn't know you needed. I didn't know that I needed Google Drive. Now I know that I need it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that I needed my smartphone of the ridiculous amount of apps I have done. Now I know that I need them. I didn't know that I need Skype or Snapchat or you name it, but I need them. <laughs> but what is also needed is education, and that is in the very Kantian way is that we need to enable especially young people to, to develop their potential or what how Kant calls it, have courage to use your own minds. And this is something education needs to do nowadays, besides only teaching how to uh, apply math. Huh? People need to be able to access capital. People need to be able to integrate this capital market. And therefore, we have the single market. This is the most beautiful thing about the European Union. And it will be the most beautiful thing about TTIP when it comes, or TTIP when it comes. And therefore, ruling out things like Uber is the most anti-social thing you can do. There was an interview with the Estonian president just some days ago when he ha was asked how to reduce the unemployment in France, for instance. He said, allow Uber, because it will, it will reduce <coughs> unemployment, especially the guys who have the least skills. They have a car, they can start their own business. If you look, for instance, and I will close by, uh, with that, if you look at places in Germany where you have full employment at the moment, we have 4.7% average unemployment, we have 5.4% unemployment in young, young people. So we have full employment. But people are still afraid that they might lose their jobs, that the jobs they have will not exist in 30 years, and that we will all be replaced by robots. But it has never happened. And always there was something new. Schumpeter's creative destruction, or what he describes by that. All, and the entrepreneurial spirit of people always makes people do something new. It's go for something more. But we need a certain different skill set. It is not enough to be able to read and write and distinguish a, read, a red, green and red button and push them. Abstract thinking is what we need. Education has to change for that. People need to be able to make use of their own minds. Unfortunately, in our region, and I've been living here for three and a half years, so I'm allowed to say that, sharing economy is here more understood that some guys from politics take advantage of businesses and thereby for, uh, and get some money and then can ship it to some places like Panama or other places. But we need brave people to take up business ventures, to be entrepreneurial, and therefore they need to be living a better tomorrow, which is possible. The news are in fact good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kahn, for uh, giving uh, the presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Gabriel Falcon. Professor Steiker is Associate Professor of Economics <coughs> at the Bucharest University of Economic Studies. Uh, his research interests include in development economics, development research, development studies, economic development, economic growth. <coughs> Um, economics of education, institutional analysis, and uh, macroeconomics, and uh, topic. His recent book is about education and um, economic growth, um, educational reform in uh, Romania from an institutional perspective. He is also co-author of uh, books, uh, including the Capitalism, the Logic of Liberty, uh, Economic Freedom and Property Rights, uh, uh, with implication for institutional reform in Romania, you, institutions, transaction cost, and economic development. Uh, he's also a co-founder and a senior fellow at the Center for Economics and Liberty. Uh, he's a member of the American Economic Association and the uh, European Economic Association. Uh, and if I understood uh, correctly, Dr. Uh, uh, Steig is also a uh, founding member of a new uh, political party uh, called the uh, Liberal Movement. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. 
Uh, I do not want to uh, talk about politics, uh, but uh, in the end, uh, I'm sure uh, um, that uh, politics will influence and will continue to influence our lives. That's why I uh, opted to uh, um, found with some of my uh, friends a political movement that uh, express all the things that uh, we share uh, from a liberal point of view. Uh, let me start my presentation with uh, a confession. I have a confession to make. Uh, first, uh, the first thought that I had in my mind uh, in order to find the proper title for the presentation was EU, a new European Soviet. And uh, I uh, remind that I'm an optimistic person, so I choose uh, EU at crossroads, more, more government or more freedom. Uh, I would like to uh, discuss a little bit about the situation of economic freedom and uh, the state intervention across the EU. And uh, I will uh, be happy to share with you some uh, uh, figures about uh, the Economic Freedom Index. Uh, we all observe that there is a tendency in our society to consider fundamental social values such as property rights, uh, property rights, freedom or rule of law uh, as old-fashioned stuff. Um, recent debate was, are, uh, was about the property rights uh, are or are not a theoretical luxury in the end. Uh, to, to invoke a little bit uh, uh, and to quote uh, the Minister of Justice in Romania. But there is a lesson that we have to learn from the past. Uh, and the lesson is quite simple. Prosperity of modern society of Western society is the result of an institutional arrangement which is compatible with the market economy, economic freedom. Therefore, not welfare state brings more prosperity. Uh, in the end, we have to uh, analyze and to admit that economic freedom was uh, uh, the basement that uh, uh, prosperity was built in uh, uh, Western countries. Uh, to quote uh, Mises, uh, um, I would like to say that if the government could extend its power ad libitum, then in an extreme scenario it could replace basically the market economy with a centralized economy. And uh, to prevent this, uh, to prevent uh, an increased power of the state and an increased interference in economic and social life, uh, the government should be constrained, uh, to, uh, should be limited by some fundamental social institutions such as constitutions, laws, and so on. Uh, and uh, we have to uh, think to those who are writing, speaking, doing, in opposed to the state intervention, uh, I prefer to call them uh, defenders of liberty because uh, uh, I do not see the state as a personal enemy for me, for instance. I, uh, I think that uh, the state is an enemy for a fundamental right such as property rights. Uh, such as uh, uh, rule of law, because I have, uh, uh, um, we used to see the distinction between laws and legislation. There is a very, very mm -hmm. narrow distinction between laws and legislation. Legislation is produced by uh, government, laws as are uh, produced by human behavior which repeats uh, uh, in time some uh, <coughs> behaviors and that behavior will lead eventually to a law. 
uh, from uh, Adam Smith, who explicitly underlined the importance of system of natural freedom for social cooperation and the welfare of individuals, this topic, especially the topic of economic freedom, <coughs> has not attracted too uh, many economists in time. Uh, the only exception is the consistent work of uh, um, Ludwig von Mises, of uh, Friedrich von Hayek, uh, Milton Friedman, and other uh, Austrian school representatives. Uh, the great news is, uh, starting from uh, 1996, uh, the first volume of Economic Freedom of the World was published. And uh, this uh, uh, report uh, became um, very quickly um, a reference uh, in economic literature. James Guartney is considered to be uh, the father of uh, uh, Economic Freedom in Index. He is uh, uh, thinking about Economic Freedom Index uh, as a useful tool to measure the quality of institutional framework in a specific country. Therefore, using uh, uh, EI, uh, EFI, we can rank a country between the two extremes. Uh, the first extreme is minimalist state versus totalitarian state. state. Therefore, uh, this is my approach of, of uh, the data that I, uh, that I uh, uh, use it. Uh, one uh, one uh, uh, more thing about the methodological uh, aspects. Uh, Economic Freedom Index has uh, five components and I use the phrase and institute uh, uh, methodology. The first one is the size of the government and taxation. The second one is private property and the rule of law. Uh, the third one refers to monetary policy and uh, uh, inflation. Um, after that, uh, we are talking about trade regulations and tariffs. And the last one uh, uh, is about the regulations uh, of business, labor, and capital markets. Uh, what are the 10 best performers? Uh, in promoting uh, freedom according to the Fraser Institute, the last uh, 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 volume that Fraser Institute published in uh, uh, last year. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, New Zealand, Switzerland, and so on. Uh, we can find uh, uh, on the 10th place the United Kingdom. But uh, what's uh, the situation in uh, Europe? I choose four countries, which can be considered, uh, uh, first of all, old members, such as uh, France and UK. Uh, new members, uh, Czech Republic and Poland, and uh, of course, Romania and Bulgaria, uh, who uh, uh, starts to uh, be part of uh, EU uh, from uh, 1st January 2007. And uh, uh, I would like to discuss a little bit this diagram because uh, we, uh, uh, the uh, time frame that I choose it is starting from uh, uh, the starting point of transition and uh, uh, the latest data that I uh, uh, had uh, uh, from Fraser Institute 2007 uh, 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 13. So, uh, there is a tendency to uh, limit the economic uh, uh, freedom uh, in the interval in the uh, uh, around 7, 7.5, <coughs> as you might see. Therefore, in the first instance, um, the EU model uh, has uh, been considered a good opportunity for emerging countries to develop. But uh, in time, uh, the catching up process in terms of economic freedom uh, has been reduced. Okay, let's analyze a little bit uh, uh, the situation that we uh, started in 1990s. 
uh, the legacy of communist countries consisted in production system which was not adapted to market conditions, low living standards, ch central planning, uh, planning in great contrast with the economy reality, low level of economic freedom as well. In Czech Republic and Poland, for instance, the social preference was favorable to shock therapy, so-called shock therapy. They have adopted major structural reforms which were compatible with uh, the rules and mechanisms of the market economy. In Romania and Bulgaria, this process turned out to be very slow. We adopted somehow gradual therapy, which was uh, uh, also inconsistent and fluctuating. The outcome of this different approach uh, of the transition period is also reflected in the evolution of economic freedom. Uh, only a, a brief look to uh, the Economic Freedom Index level in Poland and Czech Republic, which is well uh, uh, around uh, uh, seven, and Romania and Bulgaria, which uh, barely uh, exceeds five. So, the start of negotiations in 2000 to become an EU member have brought a spectacular increase in of freedom in Romania and Bulgaria. This is the positive side of the story. Based on a short run analysis, this process drives the economies on the road of more freedom and high economic growth that we have, uh, have experienced. Uh, the EU model was perceived at that time as the best recipe for growth and development <coughs> for emerging countries. But there is a cost of being part of uh, uh, EU. Because in the long run perspective, we have to admit that the EU model is promoting ceiling freedom. I choose this uh, 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 <coughs> uh, this expression because uh, uh, I haven't found uh, so far, but ceiling freedom is, uh, okay, freedom is good, but uh, uh, you have to take it uh, piece by piece, limited uh, freedom. Uh, since 2005, most, uh, most of the ex-communist countries have slowed down on their way to promote economic freedom. With an European model based more and more on centralized decisions, uh, bureaucracy and major redistributive policies, the old patterns of welfare state have re-emerged. So, uh, as we saw in uh, the diagram uh, uh, that uh, I uh, uh, slided before, uh, the ceiling freedom according to the empirical evidence seems to be around 7, 7.5. Even UK, which still has the highest score in our sample, is confronting with a decrease in terms of economic freedom. From uh, 8.6 uh, in 2000, uh, economic freedom index has dropped to 7.98 in 2013. This could be a uh, cause, of course, uh, um, of uh, uh, the future referendum on uh, um, exit the EU. <coughs> but the conclusion is, by continuing this path, economic freedom and free market in Europe are under siege. Uh, if you are interested about uh, uh, the, um, the image of the present EU that we experience today uh, and uh, the correlation that, we might, uh, that you might uh, have in mind with the uh, uh, Soviet Union, please uh, read the book of Vladimir Bukowski EU, the new European Soviet. Uh, one uh, uh, additional uh, conclusion that uh, uh, I would like to share with you is the EU social model promoted by Eurocrats is actually questioning the positive outcomes that we uh, experienced in the short run as an emerging country. Uh, and uh, let me finish 
with a coat of very gold water. I would remain, uh, remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, and moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue at all. Thank you. Professor Jola is assistant professor of international economics at the Progress University of Economic Studies. Uh, he has been director of uh, Economica, uh, Romanian academic journal of uh, economics since uh, 2009. He wrote more than uh, uh, 50 book chapters, uh, scientific articles, and conference presentation, and over uh, 600 extensive uh, articles on economics and business in the national and international mass media. <coughs> Activity distinguished with uh, numerous uh, prizes for economic journalism. Uh, let's mention his, some of his uh, academic uh, uh, distinction uh, that, uh, that include uh, the first prize of the Association of Economics, I believe, from uh, Romania for the best economic book of the year, Avatars of Multinational Corporations, as in uh, Proprietarian analysis, and uh, also uh, won the uh, prize for uh, the uh, book, the book of the year of uh, 2030, from Wall uh, uh, Street. Uh, uh, that uh, rock, uh, Romanian version of Wall Street. Uh, uh, capitalism and the logic of liberty, I already mentioned. Um, is a member of uh, several professional associations for economists and research centers such as the Romanian Society of Economics, the Center for Research in International Business and Economics, the Center for Economics and Liberty, the Center for Institutional Allies and Development, the Ludibar Mises Institute in Romania, and the Moray Rockford Center for uh, Business and Economics. Uh, and also uh, the board member of the uh, board member of Stephen uh, uh, High. So I will now give the uh, floor to the uh, Thank you, Alex. Um, you forgot to mention that I'm also the inventor of the uh, one slide presentation. <laughs> <laughs> one slide presentation is somewhere on the desktop or yeah. laptop. I will ask you to talk. And it's called J O R A, my name, and F M R S, which is the abbreviation of, of this event. Um, thank you for the opportunity to express my thoughts on a uh, topic on which I must admit I'm an extremely uh, accurate specialist, which is migration. Uh, what relationship has migration with the Development of Europe is still a question, but uh, from my experience, which uh, was duly pursued in each summer, in which I spent at least a month in a beautiful family uh, of Romanians in Spain, and I experienced the beautiful state of being interculturally integrated somewhere abroad uh, in a community which Fortunately, it does not reject you. Uh, my experience as a migrant uh, is uh, a little bit particular. Uh, I was born in Romania in a region which is called Moldova. Romanian Moldova. Um, in my uh, summer holidays, uh, I go to a people <coughs> I mentioned with a family of people which are born in Oltenia, another uh, beautiful region of Romania, and there are many jokes about Moldavians and Oltenians, uh, which are not the place here to reproduce. Uh, I, a Moldavian, go in Spain in a family of people born in Oltenia, which are very profoundly integrated in a community 
of people which were born in Maramuresh, the city in which I uh, I set up for my uh, uh, summer holidays is dominated by a uh, generous and very hardworking diaspora of Maramuresh people. And this Maramuresh people community is heavily enrooted in a community which is at the border of the Basque and Spanish community, which have a uh, profound tradition of lucrative relations beyond the historical context of internal warfare. So um, I tend to uh, experience a multiple layer sense of minority, although uh, I've never experienced the feeling of being uh, but in a community which very warmly receives me. Um, that of my presentation, which is based mostly on uh, uh, free market approach on what migration is or could be in this world and a better one, is called Migrare Humanum Est, is uh, adaptation uh, of a famous Latin victim, and I want to express few thoughts on what in my opinion is free versus fair force faith integration because when speaking about migration and their contribution to the wealth and welfare of uh, recipient communities there are also besides the economic arguments which are not very conclusive whether the migrants are uh, spurring growth or are disturbing to mechanisms supporting growth. Uh, there are also many unsufficiently discerned discussions on the ethical ground on which I try to uh, position myself and try not to shed the uh, definitive answer, at least ask listening questions. Uh, the first topic on my one slide <laughs> presentation is about freedom versus and certain of movement. Uh, we've been told that Europe has as a constant principle the freedom of movement, of good services, people and capitals. All of them are um, put together, but uh, they are extremely unhomogeneous among themselves, uh, for at least when we speak about the freedom of circulation of goods and capitals, we are definitely in the position of identifying two consenting parties, one who sells or brings the goods and the capitals, and the other which buys or receives these goods and capitals. Uh, when speaking about migration, there is a lot of uh, unconsented relationships involved there, and uh, in my view, this is the cause of the uh, inescapable trap in which nowadays Europe is caught. What to do with our more or less, quotation uh, marks, our migrants. Um, the problem here is, as it was uh, uh, the main character in uh, the other presentation, the main character in the problem of migration is the same old property rights arrangement settings. Um, here, uh, with respect to migration, um, we have a problem which we do not witness when speaking about the trade of goods or the flow of capital. Uh, we have people which go invited or uninvited, and this is the main issue, to realize who's entitled to give the invitation in the name of who. There are many people which uh, are more or less breaching this 
property, private property rights arrangement. They are crossing borders of nations who are not always willing to receive them. Although uh, it is in the nature of humans to try to travel for better places. Uh, the same old Latin dictum, uh, Atia Ubi Bene, is, uh, is immortal in a sense. Even if we travel from one part to the other of a town or of a region or of a country or of a continent or of a world, we are seeking for better conditions where to produce. This is uh, the best case scenario or where to benefit from other people's production. And this is the worst case scenario and unfortunately here European Union is uh, caught in a uh, very difficult conundrum because here in Europe we are now part or aspiring parts of a welfare state which is extremely tentative both for categories of population from within Europe but also for broad categories of population coming from uh, other parts of the world with this huge temptation to be part of the immense redistributed process of uh, um, resources uh, which by their definition the welfare states represent. Um, there is uh, a thing on which I, I, I can uh, uh, may settle a, a, a starting point of the discussion. Uh, and this point is whether we have uh, extensive arrangement of private property rights. The immigration problem would no longer be a problem because uh, the immigration problem in a world where it's utopian, I know, would, would be the, 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 the reaction for uh, most of you. In a utopian <coughs> world where all the private is private property, or all the properties, private property, uh, <coughs> the boundaries and the owners and also the trespassers are very easily identifiable. Uh, there is no dispute over this. Uh, you know whose property, home or courtyard uh, or even uh, communal property uh, belongs to and you know who is legitimately invited here and who is a fraud and trespasser. But the great problem uh, which appears in nowadays private, not so private property setting is that uh, the most part of the property which comes under uh, uh, and, and, and is the object of interest of these migrants is the so-called public property. Uh, the public property has uh, the perfect debuchet for, uh, for migrants. But this private, not so private, or pri before private and, and, and not public property, is not necessarily the property of the governments who uh, claim to be the responsible per entities uh, which are called to solve this uh, uh, immigration uh, uh, conundrum and, and, and uh, give a proper response to a pressure which uh, is uh, beyond anything else uh, modern Europe uh, experience. Uh, the governments are not the legitimate owners of the public property. Uh, and in the same time, this public property is not the property of nobody, as some other argue, and uh, considering that migration could be legitimized because uh, the migrants could be uh, uh, settled on a public unowned by any private property. Uh, nowadays, public property is uh, financed by 
coercive expulsion of resources by governments from private citizens. And uh, uh, if we could extend the principle of, of, of legitimate property acquisition and transfer. And nowadays, public property is the private sum uh, of the properties of private citizens whom should have uh, the last voice in uh, solving the situation, uh, a voice which should be uh, louder than those uh, of the bureaucrats that Brussels try to design mechanism of shifting uh, various amounts of migrants from one country to another to the despair of some citizens also to the despair of the migrant people. Um, the discussion here is whether we could imagine for the sake of the wealth and welfare of Europe a mechanism in which we can decentralize the policy of managing migration. Uh, because as uh, the current state of affairs is, uh, we are locked in a, uh, in a situation in which there is every reason to believe that the things will get worse and worse. Uh, could we uh, change the perspective and instead of looking to Brussels for responses in administering this common problem of Europe, we could, in the same <laughs> common and shared manner, solve this problem by attributing to private decision makers, <coughs> be they individuals, families, small communities, or larger ones, uh, aggregated by consensual uh, uh, will. It's a plan I, 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 I use it in order to accentuate uh, the, the fact that uh, aggregations need to be uh, voluntary in order for the agreement of the aggregates to be, to be legitimate. Can I imagine uh, an arrangement in which the problem of migration could be delegated to communities which are best equipped <coughs> with uh, resources whether they have it or not, and uh, have the proper incentives to try to digest this movement of, of, of migrants, uh, at least in a better way than uh, the uh, government authorities, which uh, are not in the position to know which is the perfect, the optimum amount of, of migrant people who can, uh, who can come in the community and, 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 and uh, add to it. Um, I worry that the, um, uh, this is um, uh, a presentation which relies more on questions than on, on, on answers, and uh, I, I, I stick to this uh, statement. Um, the problem is uh, is uh, reasonable enough to try to find uh, a way to shift the discourse, the public discourse from a centralized policy on tackling migration to a decentralized uh, engagement of communities who are willing to adopt or on the contrary, who legitimately uh, choose to reject uh, unwanted uh, citizens uh, from their uh, territories and, 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 and force them to go uh, over the boundaries. Um, could we find in nowadays heavily centralized welfare, and I, I, I try to uh, make a joke uh, there, because in uh, uh, overexploited welfare state, you tend to go from welfare to warfare very easily. Can we find a way in which such a delicate situation could be restored back to the simple, old, ancient, and unforgettable logic of private property rights, or should we be blamed to try to solve it always from far and, and, and far uh, institutions uh, which are not necessarily expressing the interests 
of neither the guest communities or of the invited or the uninvited populations traveling around the world in search for peace and prosperity. Thank you. is, number one, I uh, you forgot to mention that uh, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, okay, um, just to put uh, another, but what I'm trying to say, the whole issue, and I'm trying to make it exactly the point, where the, uh, the major catastrophe that happened the, in Brussels and Paris and so on, uh, is it most of the time when you ask in public, conversation on television and so on, immediately the government is guilty for not providing jobs, uh, for not providing uh, some ideology and so on, which is just the political correctness taken to the extreme. It's plain stupidity to know that somebody coming from a good family, you know, they were citizens of Belgium or Paris, you know, they were not a matter of uh, not having the means of economic means, but they were you know, open to this ideology. How do you answer this problem of, and then the second part would be, I mean, of this violence, you know, that is taking place, you know, by accepting that, by going to Syria and being trained and coming back. And second, how do you integrate, and that's a basic question. I myself, I'm an immigrant, okay, I can talk. Because I was there, I left for United States. Somebody paid, a well, organi private organization, right? But the word private paid for my ticket to United States, and I was paid also privately five days in a hotel. And then, it's your world, you know, make it. And Americans say, where is the will, there is a way. And I follow that. So I know how to feel in the main to integrate, it, it takes two to tangle. You know, you have to want to integrate. There's certain nations that I'm, I'm not going to mention that we do have in this country, the category that never wanted to integrate, okay? So we have an example that or people that don't want to. And, and th this is the last word, Alex. I know you're looking at me desperately. Um, and the word responsibility with anything that comes as so-called, you know, right, comes responsibility with it. When I came there in the United States, I was happy to be allowed to be in that country. I didn't go to f first, you know, well, public places and I said, hey, where's my money, you know? I need money, I need to eat, I need to, forget it. Uh, Thank you. It's good? Thank you, it's, it's good luck. Uh, <laughs> if you have uh, any other questions? If not, I'd just like to, drop, uh, to throw some numbers into this entire picture. Uh, this migration crisis that we see these days in, in Europe, first of all, it's uh, not only a question of a hum humanitarian, uh, humanitarian questions, but the second, it's also a question of costs. I mean, all this thing costs a lot of money. And there are estimates um, that, just to give you a simple example, in Austria, we spent 11,000 euro on the national level, on the, for the national budget, per, per asylum seeker every year, only on this level. Then add what comes to this, to the uh, uh, local level, and what, uh, what you add on the state level. Just this effect. Um, another number that might be of interest is that the, uh, um, a German think tank did an estimation that the uh, uh, reduction of revenues over the next um, 10 years because of the humanitarian, of, of the 
the refugee crisis in tourism industry all over Europe will be 100 billion. It's just a number. Keep it like that. But I want to say this also, because there's also the flip side of the coin. And uh, lastly, um, from the refugees, and here I say refugees, because it was not divided. There are asylum seekers, war refugees, and economic refugees. And out of these, 100% together, 18% came from Syria via the Balkan route to Europe, 18%. So the rest of the 82% were people from Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, Maghreb zone, other parts of Africa, all over. But it's not those 18% war refugees. Uh, just, I only wanted to leave you like that. And now you can draw your own conclusions. Um, and whether they integrate or not, but it's just the numbers that also need to be seen in the right way. The question is to be integrated into what? Into what social fabric? Into what, what kind of culture? In what kind of national consciousness? Because here I bring the question of na nationhood and nationality. Since in the Anglo-American tradition, they used to say from times of old, we the Englishmen have inherited these liberties. So they fought for them and they inherited uh, th those liberties. Now, the question is, are we prepared to talk about any pledge, pledge of allegiance? That any individual has to be ready to, uh, to declare publicly when we talk about giving citizenships to, to such individuals. Is that notion uh, still viable, John Palmer? Well, despite what some theorists believe, the nation state is still a reality. And within nation states, people are taxed. They're taxed for various purposes, including to support the asylum seekers that Barbara mentioned, 11,000 euros each. With rights comes responsibilities. If you have a right to apply for asylum, and while you're waiting for it or after it's granted, you have a responsibility in exchange for that protection and that support to integrate yourself, to assimilate to some extent, into the country. Now, obviously, if you are planning to go back to your homeland immediately, it's somewhat different, but most of these people stay. So with rights come responsibilities. And the bargain that the United States <coughs> always held out to immigrants of any kind, whether they were fleeing persecution or simply looking for economic opportunity, was you come, you work hard, you pay your taxes, you accept, you accept the responsibilities of either a resident or a citizen, and you assimilate into the country, including learning the language. And this model worked, has worked very well in country after country. And we depart from this model at our peril because nothing else that we've tried has worked. And sometimes, <coughs> if you go to Malmo, Sweden, you discover the opposite works very, very badly. Thank you. Any other comments? My name is Dumitru Milan. I am the president of Romanian American uh, Foundation for Promoting Education and Culture. And uh, in a way, as a representative of the host university here, I want to congratulate the organizers of this event. Uh, I had uh, personally the possibility to be inspired by uh, very, very exciting ideas or uh, proposals uh, during this discussion. But uh, I want to stress the fact that we are witnessing an impressive transformation <coughs> and uh, some analysts uh, announce us that uh, in 2025 less than 10% from the jobs will be uh, not uh, look like uh, nowadays. At the same time, uh, we need uh, <coughs> to cope with a huge challenge the educational systems uh, need to cope with. In this respect, uh, there is a fierce debate uh, at the Romanian level uh, <coughs> uh, in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, 
there, because there is uh, a huge gap <coughs> between uh, the demand from labor market and uh, the <coughs> offer by educational system. But this is a mistake because without, because without <coughs> receiving, I, I, I am speaking uh, on behalf of the universities, without receiving five years in advance, the job profiles of graduates, we cannot deliver very well prepared, very well qualified graduates. Uh, the second panel was uh, had the title Jobs, Entrepreneurship, Sharing Economy, and European Demos. 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 Not demos. <laughs> not demos, yes. I've noted uh, very few uh, ideas. What means now appropriate jobs for our young generation? What concern entrepreneurship? I guess that we are obliged to commute from management to leadership to corporate sustainability. These are very, very interesting subjects uh, to be analyzed. To do that, uh, we need to internalize the paradigm shift everybody in every occasion use this magic syntax but without more and more uh, people don't understand what means paradigm and what means paradigm shift changing the paradigm means uh, change the landscape <coughs> change the regulation and institutional uh, let's say uh, fabric and change mentalities. This is more difficult to be done. We need uh, to cope uh, in nowadays and in the near future with flat organizations, sustainable companies, more demanding com customers. We uh, need to put instead, uh, let's say, providers of goods and services and customers, <coughs> guests and hosts. At the same time, uh, we need to understand what means on-demand economy. We haven't had uh, time to discuss more what means sharing economy, on-demand economy, green society, and so on. Uh, concluding, I guess that we need to pass in Romania, in uh, European uh, standards. We need to cross, to pass from uh, logic based on conformity towards a logic based on proactivity. We need to pass from brain drain to brain circulation. And we need to pass from us versus them towards, us, towards all together. This is my message. Uh, message. Thank you very much, Professor Mino. I'm going to take one more question. Thank you.